Okay. Um, someone forgot to look at the screen and see that he was off camera. So we'll start kind of over with the rumen epithelium portion. And so we got to the rumen epithelium. Everything up here is what you have already. And so what we had is ammonia crosses the rumen epithelium. It's absorbed out of the rumen by the papillae and it goes to the blood and from the blood it's going to go to the liver. The other source or common source of ammonia is the catabolism of amino acids. So catabolism is the breakdown of amino acids and so these amino acids are being broken down into carbon skeletons and ammonia and the animal can derive energy from this process. This can occur if we feed excess amino acids. So if I feed excess amino acids to a animal, to a human even, um, this is kind of how the Atkins concept works or the um, uh, keto diet works is basically you're just consuming amino acids and that's where you're going to get your energy from is the breakdown of these amino acids. We can have it with fasting if you don't eat for a long time. Um, you'll begin to mobilize tissue or if you're not eating enough you'll mobilize tissue and that will break down amino acids. You can use those amino acids to um, get energy from and some amino acids as we talked about with propionate some amino acids are glucogenic meaning you can actually derive glucose from them um, to meet your glucose requirements not all amino acids but some but what we have to do is we have to get rid of the ammonia because ammonia is toxic, toxic to the brain. Um, it'll actually kill you if you have ammonia into your brain. So what's going to happen is, as you know, the blood from the gastrointestinal tract drains to the liver. And in the liver, we have a process called the urea cycle. And the urea cycle is going to take ammonia. And as you may have guessed, it's going to produce urea. That urea then enters your blood, and it's safe to have urea in the blood, it doesn't hurt you. And that urea can either be excreted in the urine, or that urea can be recycled to the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, and this recycling of urea to the gastrointestinal tract occurs in ruminants and non ruminants, so it occurs in both. Um, and it also occurs in the large intestine, occurs in the small intestine. You have urea in your sweat as well. Uh, but the urea that enters the rumen can be used um, as endogenous urea. And that endogenous urea can be broken to ammonia or hydrolyzed to ammonia by urease. Again, of microbial origin. Another place you can get urea or find urea is in the saliva. So if animals chew their cud more, they will secrete more urea in saliva and more urea will go to the rumen and that can be a source of ammonia for microbial crude protein synthesis. Okay, in you or pigs or horses, the microbes in the large intestine can use urea as a source of um, endogenous ammonia. They can use it as a source of ammonia to synthesize microbial amino acids. So even in you, we can use, uh, or even in pigs, we can use urea from the blood to synthesize um, amino acids by the microbes. The microbes can synthesize amino acids. Uh, one other thing before we kind of finish this up, is, well, two other things actually. Remember that we can feed urea to ruminants. We can't really feed urea to non-ruminants uh, because if we feed it to non-ruminants, it becomes ammonia very rapidly in the gastrointestinal tract. That ammonia gets absorbed and you overwhelm the capacity of the liver to detoxify it to urea. Ruminants are really good at detoxifying ammonia um, to urea. You can feed them quite a bit of ammonia or put a lot of ammonia in the rumen and they can detoxify it. You can overwhelm that um, but generally um, difficult to accomplish. We're going to draw a little picture because we like to draw little pictures. And 
so here we have the git, the gastrointestinal tract. We have the liver. Someone's knocking on the door. We have a liver. I told him to go away. And then we're going to have a heart. I gave him the five minute sign. I think they're concerned because we're missing the cushions on the couch outside my office. And I took them to see if it makes the sound sound better. I was listening to a podcast and they said they use pillows. So we'll see. Maybe it makes it sound less sharp. And then over here we have tissue. So that would be like all the other tissues. And we have the brain. Because we like the brain. And we try to protect the brain. And so... In the cow, you can have a relatively high urea concentration. And even in you, high urea concentration in the blood. That can enter the git. If it's not incorporated in microbial protein, it's going to be reabsorbed as ammonia. So you could have a high ammonia concentration, but we now have a low urea concentration. And the reason the urea concentration is low is because in the gastrointestinal tract, it was converted from urea to ammonia. And now we have all this ammonia that maybe wasn't incorporated into microbial group protein. And so in the liver, we have the synthesis, so we could make the little cycle thing remember that we have a cycle. We have the synthesis of urea. So we have now a high urea concentration, which is going to protect the brain as the heart blood goes back to the heart. It's going to protect the brain. And it's also going to prevent high ammonia from going to the other tissues. Okay. And we can think about this with glucose as well the blood going to the gastrointestinal tract would have a lower blood glucose concentration than the blood that leaves, if we've been fed, than the blood that leaves the gastrointestinal tract. The liver will kind of pull this out slowly over time, and then it goes back to the heart. We can have high glucose going to the tissue, and then low glucose going back to the heart, because the tissue has taken the glucose out and is using it for energy. Same thing with the brain, high glucose going into the brain, low glucose coming out of the brain, because your brain used that as a source of energy. Okay. Before you start the drawing, or watch the drawing video for the cow, it would be very, very useful to make sure you understand this. Okay, very useful. Okay, um, we should probably finish the math too. We'll finish the math in another. No, we'll finish that now. Okay. What we said earlier in the earlier video is that we had, we fed a thousand grams of protein. And we said that our protein source, the UIP was 40% and the DIP would then be 60%. And this could be RUP and RDP, however you wanna do it. So 40%, 1,000 times 40% equals 400 grams of UIP. 1,000 times 60% equals 600 grams of UIP. We said that UIP, if you go back and look at the notes, is on average approximately 80% digestible, which means, I'll write the digestible, which means 80% of it will be absorbed, so we're going to absorb 320 grams 
of amino acids, dipeptides, and tripeptides are absorbed. 600 grams of, UI, of DI, uh, DIP, bad mistake. DIP means all 600 grams of that, by definition, will be digested. Okay, it's all going to be digested because to be degradable means you must be digestible. Okay, all 600 grams. Okay, what we don't know is we really have two ways that that 600 grams can go. Okay, it could be absorbed in the rumen as ammonia, so not terribly valuable to the cow, or it could be used to synthesize microbial crude protein. Okay, and the big driver, what determines whether it's this or this, whether it determines whether it's ammonia or MCP, equals the amount of fermentable organic matter supplied. Increase fermentable organic matter equals increased MCP. Okay, the opposite's true too. If you decrease the amount of fermentable organic matter, you decrease the MCP synthesized. This is the true, whether we're talking about the reticular rumen or we're talking about the large intestine. The more fermentable organic matter, the more ammonia you can capture, the more nitrogen or DIP you can capture in microbial crude protein. And that's what we wanna do is we wanna capture it in microbial crude protein. Okay. There's a number for this, and the number's more or less kind of sort of right. And basically, the number says for every 1,000 grams of fermentable organic matter, we get 130 grams of MCP. Okay, so, or you could think about it as 13%. Okay, and to effectively use that 1,000 grams of fermentable organic matter, I need to have 130 grams of DIP. So my DIP requirement equals my MCP produced. Okay? So that's just by definition. It's not a great definition, but it's by definition. So if I fed 2,000 grams of fermentable organic matter, I would expect to produce 260 grams of MCP. Okay, what we have is we have 600 grams of DIP. And what I wanna basically know is um, how many grams of fermentable ma organic matter I could utilize. So I could take the 600 grams and divide it by 13 or divide it by 13%. Grab my phone, which works as a calculator. And so take 600, divide by 0.13, means I could feed my cow 4,615 grams of fermentable organic matter and have it use it. Okay, and if I did that, I would get 600 grams of MCP. And we said MCP is, so 600 grams MCP 
times approximately 80% true protein means I have 480 grams of true protein. And then we said that was 80% digestible. So 480 grams of true protein times 80% digestible equals 480 times 0.8 equals 384 grams of MP. So MP was metabolizable protein. That would be the grams of amino acids, dipeptides and tripeptides absorbed. And so we have 300 grams of MP or amino acids, 384 from, DI from the microbes. We have 320, if you go way back up here, we have 320 from the UIP. So 384 plus 320 is 407. We have 704 grams of MP. Okay. I feel like I might make some example problems for you guys to think about or work. Okay. But we'll be done for today. Thanks.